Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Are we? We're, we're, we're rolling. I just wanted to see what kind of sounds you make in the beginning. Because it's still, it's early again. And yes, I, it is. Sometimes I note that when it's so early, you, you make some sounds that I think are, I find entertaining. Uh, <laughs> he says expectantly. <laughs> it's like, come on. Poke, poke, make a sound, make a sound. In, in the script, it would say, cut to close-up, Andy's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> oh.
Auga. Auga. <laughs> How's that one? <laughs> zing, 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 zing. Uh-oh. I like it. I like oh, it. Oh, my, my. Let me have some more coffee. <laughs> how, how, how are you this fine Phoenix morning? I'm good. I'm good. It was a little harder getting up this morning because, uh, you know, yesterday was a holiday and all. And that just meant it was a very busy day with lots of food and staying up late blah 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 do you do do you do you have a fourth of july kind of a bash is it a family thing you get together it's kind of like christmas but in the summer do you do that do you open it's, presents it's not no we did kind of more of a uh it, it would be great if we opened presents on the fourth of july. <laughs> I don't know great. why that came out. I don't think there's any culture, in, any <laughs> microculture in the United States where they actually open presents on the Fourth of July. But uh, oh, a flag! Okay, would... Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, we just um, we just had a family day, just the four of us hanging out and um, playing. You know, it was actually raining here yesterday, so we played in the rain, and then we did a lot of cooking and just hung out. We relaxed and watched a movie, and then. And then by the time the fireworks rolled around, um, most of the kids were asleep. And Aunt and I were like, well, that's all right. We don't need to go see fireworks. We've seen them before. <laughs> seen them before. <laughs> uh, well, because what time does it get dark in Phoenix? It get, uh, right now, it's, oh, geez, I don't know, 8, 830, mm. somewhere in there. So we're in, well, we're in Chautauqua right now, but we live in, uh, in, in Portland. It's about the same Latitude, longitude, level, same latitude. level, same latitude, same latitude, and uh, and it gets dark late this time of year. Nine thirty, nine forty, mm-hmm. means the fireworks don't start until ten. Yeah, and the kids are, you know, they're exhausted. They don't know why they're filled with rage at that point <laughs> of the night. They don't know why they're just really mad at everything. Yes. <laughs> but they are because it's late and they're exhausted oh, yeah. after a full day of camp. So, but it was it was it was good. The the biggest challenge is here. You know, there's this giant bell tower with this big bell in it. And at ten o'clock, they, they on Fourth of July they play a half hour of patriotic tunes on bell tower. Nice. And you think it's you, you, at first you think wow that's really sweet. And then you're standing by the bell tower for a half hour and you realize you've gone completely deaf with patriotic tunes. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing left. <laughs> Your brain matter is all turned to mush. By the end of the half hour, yeah. they're getting to like the really obscure <laughs> patriotic tunes. Exactly. Like, what is this one? I think that's, I think <laughs> that's actually Morrissey. What is that? <laughs> anyway, uh, so so it's good. It's all good. So uh let's let's talk about this movie let's let's so so we're starting a a a short series um really kind of i guess our focus is jack cardiff the cinematographer and um, we're going to do two films that he was the cinematographer for tonight we're going to begin with the red shoes 1948 um michael powell and emmerich Pressburger film. I the Red Shoes. Now the reason we're do, we're inspired to do the Red Shoes is uh cuz I'm in Chautauqua, New York and Chautauqua Institution uh is a is a summer thing you can learn about it at ciweb.org. It's a it's a fun kind of a program it brings people from all over the world and and they have a theater on the um, on the grounds here and it is a classic old theater and it is uh, like it's it's every bit the theater that that um, you know I remember sort of growing up before they tore it down and turned it into a church you know it's got the double decker kind of this two story you can go up in the loft and and watch these this film and and they you know they play kind of regular run movies in this classic old theater uh but every other wednesday uh david zinman uh, during the summer session, David Zimmer, who's a film critic and a, a writer, does a classic film series uh, movie where he brings, um, the, you know, these great classic old films uh, into this great classic old theater and plays them for an audience before a, he leads a, a discussion, a commentary discussion. And uh, last Wednesday was The Red Shoes, and I had never seen it. 
So I immediately call Andy and I say, Andy, what do you think? Should we do the red shoes? Is it worth talking about? I, <laughs> I love I love the idea of talking about a movie uh, that that I'm seeing in this classic old theater for the first time. It's 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 like going back in time a little bit to 1948 and and uh, um, seeing this movie first run. It's that experience is really very visceral to me, and I it's it's very powerful. And and Andy says, Oh, Scorsese loves it. We should totally do it. <laughs> and I said, Well, if Scorsese loves it, you got it. Man. <laughs> Uh, uh, so uh, I, I would also add on the website at rashpixel.tv if you if you were scrolling through now I've added the series right below the title that we're talking about so you know Bull Durham is in the baseball series and so this, this I've actually this will be in, in uh, I'm also, also adding a classics series and so okay, this, cool. this will be in the classic series as well as the yeah so um, I so again I'd never seen this movie and and um, and you know Scorsese's hands are all over it. I will say that the restoration uh, of this movie is possibly the best I've ever seen. I mean, this is absolutely gorgeous. This movie, the restoration they did with this, which you know we can talk a little bit about. Uh, it it was a stunning uh, process. I mean, it's it, the film looks gorgeous, and it was just an amazing amount of work to get to that point. So. It's it's a, a very big challenge to take a film, um, you know, a, a, in three strip Technicolor, which is how this film was shot. You're, which you're going to need to obviously talk about. Yeah, for... we'll have to talk about it. and and just um, <laughs> really, you know, clean up every single frame and make it look as good as it does. And it's definitely something that is well worth seeking out and and looking at on the um i think the restoration finished in 2009 they um played it at the con film festival and uh, and then it subsequently has been released on dvd and blu-ray through the criterion collection and it is very much worth your time to go and rent it and or buy it if you feel inclined and, and look at it because it's just a stunning film to look at it is absolutely beautiful the the um well, so first, let's talk about the movie, and I I want to talk about this, this, uh, you know, I went to the Ebert. I went for, very first. I went to the Ebert. And yeah, and I have to say, I was a little. <laughs> his review was a little um, confused. <laughs> well, right, and so the first line of the Ebert's <laughs> review was this: "There is a tension between two kinds of stories in the Red Shoes." And that tension helps make it the most popular movie ever made about the ballet and one of the most enigmatic movies about anything. <laughs> Roger <laughs> speaking in broad strokes. <laughs> oh, dear Roger, yes. Uh, all right. So He's, yeah, yeah. Where, anyway. where, where do we where do we start our conversation after after that? This is an enigmatic movie about anything. How is one expected to even begin to talk about the Red Shoes <laughs> when it's as enigmatic as this? It's a pretty straightforward story, I think. I, you know, I guess real quick, just a, a quick synopsis of the story would probably help. Yes, please. our dear listeners. Um, our story follows a young dancer uh actually at the beginning it starts by following two people a young dancer unknown she um wants to dance with this ballet company the lermontov uh, dance company which is very much patterned after if you're if you know anything about dance it's very much like uh, uh diabolev and the ballet russe um and I didn't know that. I just <laughs> looked it up. <laughs> you just dropped a ballet bomb, man. That's right. <laughs> uh, so anyway, she wants to dance with this band, dance company. Um, the impresario who runs it, um, Boris Lermontov, is just a very cold, ruthless, controlling figure. But at the same time, there's this this very oddly charismatic thing about him. Um, so she approaches him, ends up getting an audition, and gets to be in the company. At the same time, we're also following the story of a young composer who goes to a ballet um, that his professor has written the music for, 
and Lermontov happens to have done the uh, choreography or directed the ballet. And he realizes as he's listening to it that his professor had essentially stolen his music. So he goes and confronts Lermontov and says, look, this music is mine. Lermontov ends up hiring him. And we see as this young dancer, Vicky, and this composer uh, basically start um, growing and becoming bigger and better in the process of working with Lermontov. And uh, Julian, who's the composer, gets asked to write the Ballet of the Red Shoes based on Hans Christian Andersen's story. And, um, and he does, and it's this uh, amazing story about a girl who puts on these red ballet shoes um, that this kind of crazy little man um, gives to her. And these ballet shoes, uh, she dances the night away and has a great time. But then when she wants to take the shoes off, uh, she finds they can't because the shoes aren't done dancing. And basically the shoes dance her, um, you know, all over the mountains and everywhere. And, and she dances for forever and eventually dies because of these shoes that she can't take off. It's a very tragic little story. Um, so anyway, this director, the impresario uh, Lermontov, wants Vicky to basically be the next big thing. And he's like this controlling puppet master who is like wants to see her you know, become this great ballerina uh, th through him. So um, they agree. She agrees, and they go off and they start dancing and and performing everywhere. Little does he know that the composer and the ballerina have fallen in love, and he is the sort of guy who believes you have to choose dance or love. You can't have both. And he gets upset. He fires them, and uh, he brings her back eventually because she just can't let go of her art. And now she's torn between love and art. And uh, as she's about to dance the red shoes again, she doesn't know what to do. And the shoes kind of like take on a life of their own, or do they? And she runs and she jumps off of a, off of a uh, building and uh, in front of a train and gets run over by a train. <laughs> in front of the train that we are to presume is on the way because, doc because uh, you know, her love is walking down the train uh, parallel to the train tracks and where I, I think, you know, he's, he, th that climactic scene is, you know, she's running toward the balcony and he hears her and runs back toward her and the train is coming and he's, it just keeps cutting back and forth. I think there's something to, you know, running toward the train that may is about to take him away. Yeah. 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 She's, you're right. She is crushed. But then her last line, uh, Julian, take off the red shoes. Mm -hmm. She's lying there covered in, in blood and soot and ash <laughs> and, <laughs> and train tracks. <laughs> and then she dies. It's, it's a much more um, kind of a melodrama. melodrama. Uh, it feels very much like a, um, I, you know, I don't want to say like a, a soap opera, but it definitely has kind of that, you know, that very high emotion level yeah. that you'd get in some films from the 40s and 50s you know it, it it definitely feels that way yet at the same time it also feels like there's a lot more going on here I yeah think. yeah yeah i i do too so so now we've got the well and and i think one of the most sort of powerful bits is right at the end um, so after they take off the red shoes lermontov comes back out uh, on stage because you know there she was about to go on and uh and they end up going on with the show and they perform the red shoes but he had said earlier in the film he'd said you know you no one has danced the red shoes since you left the company as he's trying to convince her to come back and no right. one ever will right no one but you ever will dance the red shoes and so the the end he comes out on stage and i think in in one of the more powerful performance from Anton uh, Walbrook, who uh, plays uh, Boris Lamontov, I think it's an incredibly powerful performance when he announces 
that the red shoes is going on because she would have wanted it that way. And they, they do the entire ballet without her in it. Um, right. they, they, and they keep the spotlight where she would be. So it's this, this sort of ghost performance of hers and everybody's dancing in the dark around this empty spotlight. It's a, it's a really beautiful way to sort of cap this film. Yeah. Yeah. It's very haunting and it is, uh, it does speak well to kind of the nature of, of, uh, what the red shoes meant to him and, uh, how the story played out. It's a, it, it is a very haunting film. And um, it's definitely not what you'd call like a a, um, a musical comedy. You know, it's, it, <laughs> is it, it does to a certain extent a movie about ballet. It seems like it's going to be kind of a, a, you know, much more light, something along the lines of an American in Paris or something. Um, but yeah, this is definitely a kind of a, a darker drama. It definitely, definitely um, is not as uplifting a film. Nor, yeah, nor is it a f fairy tale. I mean, you, you see the red shoes based on Hans Christian Andersen, and let's let's face it, uh, Hans Andersen, uh, he was dark. Yeah, I mean, he's he, you know, he, like the his, like his grim fairy grim tales. Yeah, yeah. They have a propensity to kill little girls. Yeah, and this one definitely is a dark story. I mean, the red shoes. It, you know, it's it's slightly different. You know, in the in the in his fairy tale version, it's like a soldier on crutches who gives this girl some shoes mm -hmm. eventually she dances until she um asks the the priest i think to cut uh, no the executioner to cut off her legs and he does and he gives her some crutches and then you know she um, is able to be pardoned and but she still dies and it's like a very dark tragic stories you know yeah um so why uh, why is this movie so beloved? You know, I think there's a, a, a number of reasons. I think a big one is um, it is a very high emotional story. And it's, it's a beautiful story and it's beautifully done. And um, something that we didn't mention is that when they actually put on the show The Red Shoes midway through the movie... Um, they put on the the whole show like you watch like a 15 minute ballet of the red shoes performance and this was the first time that that had ever happened in a film where they essentially stop the movie and show you this ballet and then bring you back into the movie afterward it hadn't really happened before right. especially to that length and that wasn't something people were expecting so I think that um, anyone who is a fan of ballet really appreciated the fact that this was, you know, like the first time a movie had really depicted ballet uh, to such a, an honest level. And I think they all appreciated that. Um, also, the um, the nature of the the story, despite the high emotional and, and melodramatic level of the story it's very um it's a very interesting look at art versus um life and and just love and and anything else and how art can drive you and how art can be something that um you can't live without if that's something that you you were born to do if you're born to be an artist of some sort, you know, you're, you're left in this place where you can't live without it. And the fact that she, at, in the end, feels she has to choose between love and art, you know, drives her mad, essentially. And, you know, there's a great conversation between Vicky and Lermontov right at the beginning where, you know, when he doubts that, you know, she can really do much in the way of dance, he says, why do you want to dance? And she right back to him, she says, why do you want to live? Mm -hmm. And I think I think that you know rhetorical question kind of tells you exactly you know the nature of art in this film. So I think that had a lot to do with um, the popularity of this film, and and also the growing popularity. It wasn't as popular when it first came out, especially in England. It uh, did grow in popularity a lot because you know in the U.S. it it came over here and played. I think they only put it in one theater initially, but it played for like 110 weeks in that theater. 
And then Universal is just like, wow, there might be something to this movie. And they picked it up in, I think, 1951. They released it and they just, it made tons of money. Oh, uh, say again. A hundred and ten weeks. Yeah. Over two years, this movie played in that theater. Yeah. This, this was a time when that happened. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's uh, that's sort of hard to wrap your head around a little bit. That, that's a, I guess, a different discussion. I the the um, uh, I I think when I when I look at this movie, mm-hmm. uh, it it's it's another one of those where it's a it's a complex story because it it's it's a long film that weaves a lot of nuance in the principal characters. Uh, uh, arcs, right? Um, I, I think in particular we need to talk about uh, Lomontov's role between these two characters, Julian Craster and, and Vicky. Uh, because he is, I think, to, for me, the most interesting character in the in the film. Uh, I, I, I don't mean to, to sort of minimize Craster's r- role. He's the, the ingenue orchestra uh, you know, con- composer. He's the right. the coach, the orchestra coach, and then composer. And she is the ingenue dancer. Uh, you know, and prima ballerina. Um, but he is uh, Lamontov uh, plays this role of. Um, and I, I read somewhere the the using the term Mephistopheles. Uh, for right. his for his portrayal of the film and and you don't get that up front you know he is the impresario and the the sort of head of this company uh and in the first 45 minutes i think up to the ballet up to the the sort of 17 minute performance that is mm-hmm. smack in the middle he is he, really we just see him as the the rude and um emotional uh sort of reactionary impresario of the company and everybody sort of has their, they sort of exist in an orbit around him, but you get it. I mean, you, you get what he's trying to portray. And after the ballet, uh, he becomes much more sort of complex and you have to start questioning kind of his motivations. Uh, and, and he gets much sort of darker and some of his, um, um, you know, some of the scenes where you see him alone, in his office mm-hmm. or in his home end up being much darker where he, he puts his fist through the mirror, for example, after she's left the company. And, and, and uh, so you start wondering what, what was he out for and why is he so upset? Um, we've already seen him fire one of his prima ballerinas because she fell in love. She chose love over dance. Did he do it because he was in love with her? in some way or is is he really um, sort of wielding power to create these creatures of dance like is he really manufacturing creatures of dance and and does he have this sort of personal stake in their creation and when they choose something other than his you know his what he has planned for them you know does he is he wielding power to to sort of destroy what he's created um, and he does so unsuccessfully. I mean, they, they, you know, with the exception of the red shoes and, and Vicky, uh, you know, she obviously throws herself off a bridge, but, um, but the, the first ingenue that he fires ends up happily, you know, going on and marrying her true love and has a small dog and lives in France. Mm-hmm. Um, but but his you know I think his role and the way he transforms through the course of this um, of of the second half of the film I think is really uh, wonderful I mean it's wonderful to the, the way he you see him wield his power and lose control I think Anton Walbrook's performance of of this character is complex and dark and uh, and um, just deeply emotional and deeply troubled um you know all the way to the very bitter end it, he's a it's a fascinating performance by him and it really is haunting i mean yeah when you see him talking about when he's first you know pitching to julian 
the idea of of composing the red shoes and he's standing in his study and he's got this strange statue of a of, of a ballerina's foot he's yes <laughs> you know like in uh whatever that pose is called when they're up on their toes um and he's standing next to it and he's like stroking it you know you can see that it's it's this control of 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 these uh these dancers it's like they're his puppets and and he is this this artist who must create and it's yeah it's interesting because i don't it's i i think when you bring up you know was he in love with them it, it almost seems like he was in love with them like you said um only as the artist that they could be and and how they could um and how he could use them right yeah, how he could, it's, and and I th I love that you bring up that sculpture. I hadn't I hadn't uh, sort of made that connection, but that really is. I mean, he's the way he worships, you know, and I use that word intentionally. The way he worships that toe, and mm -hmm. and the the sort of the clay that it was, and now the sculpture that it is is the 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 metaphor carries really brilliantly. And he'd already said in the very beginning, I think, in one of the most. Um, uh, one of the uh, sort of wonderful opening scenes with the, the benefactor of the ballet in the opening scene or the opening party, um, you know, he, she says, you know, we're going to be treated with, with a performance. And he says, you know, I, what is, what is ballet to you? And she says, well, I guess it would be the study of movement or the practice of movement. And he said, to you, it is a practice to me. It is a religion. And, mm -hmm. uh, and and I think that carries through. I mean, you, you that's the that's the teaser at the beginning, to ultimately his the his unraveling at the end, when his religion is is defiled by her her death by Vicky's death, and also by their love. And I, I think you see that pretty blatantly in the scene after he's learned that they've started dating and he's watching. Um, a performance of I'm not sure which one it is Swan Lake or something um, he's watching them perform and he sees Julian sneak it you know take a little mm -hmm. chance and blow her a kiss and he's just like did you see that she smiled and and it's almost like you know doing something obscene in a church and he's just so upset by yeah it. and, and it, it's it's really interesting how how he turns on on Julian, really, not so much on Vicky because, you know, she is the clay that he's trying to mold and he feels that Julian is is messing up the clay. Right. Right. right and right. so he wants to keep he wants to keep Vicky. But because she's in love with Julian, they both leave. Right. Um, so it's uh, you know, it, it really is is tragic for him. And, and I mean, he does go on. But you're right. It's not until he's able to draw uh, Vicky. Well, I don't even know he draws Vicky back in. He just talks to her. It, really, it's her because, like, like we've said, you know, it's this art driving her. And even though she loves Julian, she cannot turn down the opportunity to dance the red shoes again. Right. Um, it, one of, one of the things I think is interesting in that scene where he where he shuns Julian mm -hmm. is that he. He uses the same language when he talks about her performance to talk about his new work, his new orchestra, you know, his new um, uh, composition. Uh, he says it is impossible, right? I mean, this mm -hmm. this work is impossible because you too, Julian, have sold out to love, and your work is not the same. Just as just as she is unable to dance at the same level that she is is to be able to dance. You are, are, you know, this work is now garbage. Now, what's interesting about that is that later, you know, as he's walking out of the theater, the, the, um, uh, the, the dance master, uh, mm -hmm. uh, gosh, Luke Yubov. Is that the dance? Leonid Messine? Is that, yeah, Leonid Messine uh, is the... Yubov, uh, the dance, the, the, um, also yeah. plays the crazy clown benefactor right. of the red shoes in the ballet. Um, he says, you know, this, the new work is great. I've got most of the choreography figured out. He says, you know, Julian Cresta will be leaving the company. And I says, are you crazy? He says, this is fantastic. We've been working for two weeks on this fantastic new piece. So you're left to think, okay, who is he, who is, uh, 
you know, who is Lamontov lying about? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because clearly he actually uh, he actually liked this new work. Um, well, I think I think uh, Lubov actually says it's the best thing he's ever written. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so there there is this powerful triangle, and and I think that's one of the things that makes this movie so sort of. Um, you know, back to why it has become a beloved film, uh, it, it is it, that, that triangle between Julian Craster and Lamontov and, and Vicky. There are, there are so many, um, there are so many complexities between each of their relationships, the relationships with one another that, uh, that make it even at the end, you know, she dies and, and the resolution is incomplete and it leaves you thinking mm -hmm. you know what what really were the dynamics uh, in those relationships and I, I think that complexity uh, and and those unanswered questions uh, make this movie uh, so much more interesting than I think a, a simple ballet movie yeah and I think it's fascinating how they take Hans Christian Andersen's story and in a way you've got this you know uh, Chinese box of a story where you've got the ballet, the story within the story, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yet the the nature of this short story of the Red Shoes is tied into both of them, right? You've right. got it in the ballet itself, but then you also have it in the film. And I, I, the thing I find so fascinating is the ending with Vicky and her final final decision if it's her or you know um whatever it is when she's torn between um leaving with julian or going out and doing the red shoes again for boris and the 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 rift between art and love and how there's that shot it cuts to as she as after Julian's left and she's getting ready to go down to the stage and you see her leave and it cuts to her shoes and she's wearing the red shoes because she's going about to go on stage. Mm -hmm. And although this is, you know, side note here, it's kind of an issue of um, uh, much discussion because in the show, she doesn't start the show with the red shoes on. She doesn't put the shoes on until in the show. Right. Which, you know, little side note, but, you know, um, Michael Powell, I think he ended up saying, you know, it doesn't make any sense if, if she's not wearing them. Because at this point in the film, you know, you really need her in those shoes. Well, okay. One of those so so why, where, what's, your, what's your personal position on that? I, I, well, I, I think what's so fascinating is it, it feels like they're, like the shoes really are having some control. Like there is this... Um, supernatural element to these shoes that are almost driving her away yet at the same time i i don't think it is the shoes i think it's i think it's just the nature of this this um internal rift within vicky that's created this where it it leads her to this but i don't i, I don't know if she would have done it if she weren't wearing the red shoes or weren't about to perform the red shoes i I so I I saw the film in the theater and then uh, then I did a bunch of reading on it and sort of learned that this was a point of contention because it did not hit me at all and even though I I feel like I was cognitively kind of I was aware that the shoes were um, you know that that we were made very aware that she was wearing the shoes before mm -hmm. the performance my my take on it was exactly what you just said that there is a there is a supernatural piece at work here. And that's another point in the film where, uh, you know, up to the ballet, uh, it's, a, it's a film that is based very much in realism, right? It's a practical film uh, about the story of ballet. And then the ballet happens. And the ballet itself, which we should talk about specifically, yeah. is crazy town, right? I mean, <laughs> it's crazy. It's an Edvard Munch painting, right? I mean, it is... Right. It is crazy, and after that, the film changes, and it, it. I think that ballet marks the transition from realism to fantasy, and in we are now in the fantasy, and at that point, the shoes have taken over, and we need the shoes to have taken over because we need to see how the shoes become this external vessel of her drive 
to make choices that are, are not in her best interest. We need that to happen in order to believe that, that when she throws herself off the balcony, um, that, that that makes sense. And, Mm -hmm. and so I, you know, I'm, I'm with the, you know, the filmmakers and I'm, I I think that goes to the complexity of, of the, the construction of this film that, uh, you know, we, we're firmly in the second half of this movie. We're in the fantasy of this film now we're in the red shoes. And, and if, if you're not in the red shoes, you don't get that. You don't understand it. If your head's not in the red shoes, in the fantasy of the film, you don't, you, you, that wouldn't make sense. Exactly. Yeah. You very much have to be buying into that, that heightened emotion and, and that touch of that magic that's running in the story at this point. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. so, so can we, can we talk about the ballet? What, and, yeah. And you, I, I think that's, it's, it's a, aside from the fact that they, you know, had a, you know, 15 minute ballet right in the middle of the film, it was a very unique decision to depict it the way they did because oftentimes when ballet or other theatrical performances had been put inside a film, it was always done as if, you know, the camera's in the audience watching and you're getting to see it as if the audience would. This was really, um, a, a, I think a very smart move on their part where they almost chose to show it subjectively from the point of the dancers. And you got to see the, the show I mean, it, it doesn't take very long. It's like once she's put the shoes on, you're almost you're on stage with them. And then all of a sudden you're not even on a stage. You know, you're yes. uh, you're on on these fantastical sets. And as she's dancing through these these magnificent, you know, painted landscapes that she's just dancing across that are just are, are stunning visuals to look at. And she's dancing with with um, a, a swirling bit of newspaper blowing along that turns into a man and so these magical elements like that um, end up be becoming real and it brings us into the magic and we we really get drawn into the the mindset of a dancer and we get to see this world from their point of view and they do hit the nail on the head a little too hard a few times like um they have she had had a conversation earlier in the film how she didn't know how she could you know when they do a lift like how is she supposed to be a cloud how is she supposed to be a a flower and uh, they do cut to a point where as she's being lifted we see her transform into a flower and a cloud and it's a little Mm -hmm. on the nose but you know i a certain extent i i think that's a a minor complaint i think overall it's just it's done so well and this this dance that really just um is in vicky's mind by this point and and bringing this magic of these red shoes to her and we're seeing the art and what it means to her and the other thing that really ties it in interestingly is as she's dancing and as we're watching this we see the little man who sells her the red shoes he transforms very dramatically from this little man to uh, the the um, to Lermontov, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden he transforms to Julian, and it's really interesting how it shows the control these men have on her life, and the, and and what they represent, and how it's tearing her apart. Which is sort of why that the the red shoes and you can see the red shoes the red shoes uh, the ballet portion of the red shoes is uh, you know somebody has posted it in three parts on YouTube um, so you know if you've never seen the film and you want a synopsis of the film watch this ballet and and it does in you know fifteen minutes um, wrap up in a tidy little bow through ballet the entire story of the film and and even kind of the emotional complexity of the film and the transformation of the film from realism, the realism of the ballet in the opening uh, segment through the fantasy of the ballet as she's standing on a, on a, you know, ocean cliff and the, and the mm-hmm. ocean is sort of the, you know, uh, superimposed on top of her stage. It's, it's, uh, um, you know, you see the whole thing all the way through her death. Um, and, and it's a tidy little bow. Um, but, but really, I mean, I think if, if we're going to transition to a conversation of Jack Cardiff, 
um, the ballet is a great place to start. Uh, I mean, yeah. here's a guy who, you know, whose career um, w- was sort of hinged on experimenting with exactly what he did in the ballet uh, in, in terms of composition and color and, and uh, uh, execution. Yeah, he was, um, yeah, he had actually worked with uh, Powell and Pressburger, who we, we haven't really discussed, but a very interesting pair of directors. But he had worked with them on, I believe, three other films before this. And this one um, was right after Black Narcissus. And this was, I, I believe, the fourth three strip Technicolor film that they did together. He ended up getting um, asked by technicolor and in hollywood to uh come on board and do some of these um early experiments with with this new technology and and he initially was like oh i don't know if i'm the guy for that but he ended up coming on board and really became a master in using the 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 color process that this this had and creating these just stunningly gorgeous films can i mean you, can you talk a little beautiful. bit about about three strip technicolor why was this a novel achievement in in film yeah three strip technicolor um you know they they came out with this uh, actually quite early on in in the uh in the world of film it, it, they in the 20s and 30s they began developing three strip technicolor and what it was is a, a camera essentially actually had three strips of film in it um because at the time, you know, it was mostly still black and white. And what they did is they had these three um, different filters that the the image would go through. And each strip of black and white film, uh, the three strips, would get the light from it. And it would go, you know, one would be capturing the green portion of the film. One would be capturing the... Um, the blue portion of the film and i think the other is magenta so they'd each capture so there would be a blue strip a green strip and a magenta strip that you know they'd go through this filter they'd capture the light in that color spectrum and then what they would do is they'd go and they would essentially kind of dye that film and they would layer these three strips on top of each other and you would create a color film so it was a very tedious process it was a very um, long process to actually make this film um, but it created the, these stunning stunning colors i mean the colors that you saw in these three three strip technicolor films was explosive i mean it was just the the color was just so saturated and so strong that it was just beautiful to look at um and i think they were doing this until the mid 50s and you know i think it was just a process that uh, they came up with better color uh with just a single strip by this point and it was just easier for people to just use one strip of film rather than going through this this arduous process of doing the three strips so they 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 gave up on it um so i mean that's essentially kind of a you know the the down and dirty version i guess of three strip technicolor Mm -hmm. It, uh, okay, go ahead. You were going to... Uh, well, no, I was just going to say, and, and what made it really difficult in the restoration process is not only do you have to find a, a great print to use, um, to use as kind of the, the foundation for um, the cleanup process. I mean, because when you're restoring a film, you you get as many prints of it as you can find. And then essentially for every frame of film, you try to find which one has the cleanest frame so you can begin with something that's clean um, and then work from there to fix it. In this process, you have to find three. And so you have to find the green strip, the red strip, and the blue strip. And then you have to get all three cleaned up and working but you also have to make sure that all three of them still line up and work together. And right. what they found over time is that the colors had had been modeled and um, it almost looked like the colors, as they would play it, were almost like dancing because the color, the way that the color was affected over time. And, uh, and it just created this really 
awful thing that they had to clean up. Also, the film prints had gotten moldy and it, it had cracked and, and it made a mess of the film. So they had major work to do. And then there was shrinkage issues. And some of the frames actually, when you lined the three films up, they wouldn't line up anymore because one of them would be slightly um, shrunken. And so they had to really do a lot of work to to find all the right pieces to uh, make this film work and look as beautiful as it does. Now, the, what's interesting about this is that, you know, this movie was released in 1948. Um, you know, and I, I think we, we'd already, we were already pretty heavily into uh, ex- color films, uh, you know, for sort of 25 years prior. We'd, we'd been seeing sort of color films hitting the cinema but but this one for some reason you know here in the late 40s these films these three strip technicolor films were were notably different uh, and and technicolor was um you know as a company was heavily experimenting in in this process and i think the um you know i think this film and and maybe i'm spoiled by the restoration of it which you could talk a little bit about but um this film as you say i mean the colors are so exceedingly gorgeous mm-hmm. uh that that it really becomes a, a showpiece for for the technology of the time uh and you know even though sort of in the 1940s we were already heavily seeing mostly mostly color films particularly yeah. in the late 40s yeah, and by, even by that point, I don't think as many films were shot in three-strip Technicolor. I think you were still getting a good number of them that were just, you know, um, by that point, I think they had developed some single-strip Technicolor mm-hmm. films that was, you know, easier to use. It wasn't as as complex, but there was something magical about this three-strip Technicolor film that people um, really loved. Loved and they they used it for um, quite a while and it, it's it's just it makes for a gorgeous image and yeah we're, I think we're lucky to have had this, this film restored to see it um, as it looks now because I mean it's it's masterful it's well, stunning so so talk a little bit about uh, about Cardiff's uh, sort of role in in uh, visualizing this film and bringing the visual identity of this film to to life. He, you know, it's funny because he talked about, um, <laughs> I think, um, on Black Narcissus, he, they talked to him about it. They said, hey, Jack, what do you think of ballet? And he <laughs> said, um, as he says, you know, very um, naively, he said, oh, I think it's, you know, I don't think much of it. It's a bunch of sissies prancing around and <laughs> I just don't, <laughs> I have no interest in the ballet. And they're like, well, you might want to start going to some ballets because our next film is going to be about the ballet. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, so, prancing around. <laughs> so he he actually um, they they made him go watch like ballets for weeks on end, and by the end of it, he realized how artful it was and how much beauty there really was in it. And he ended up um, falling in love with the ballet um, in the process of making this film. His his contributions to this, I mean, aside from just the the film as a whole and creating a gorgeous looking film with amazing color uh it's very well lit and it just the this the way that the cinematography works in this film is is very strong the the light plays so nicely i mean you see it in a scene like um the well what the scene you had brought up already when um when larmentov is sitting alone in the dark in his study and he's fuming and he's pounding his fist into his hand and then he smashes the mirror it's just this moody dark scene but you can see just the detail and and it's just stunning to look at um but then you look at something like the dance at the the actual ballet and you see these amazing um scenes where you have vicky as she wants to take these shoes off and you see the the spotlight in the spotlight on her you see these shadowy hands reach up and and like almost control the shoes and these shadows won't let her take take off the uh won't let her take off the shoes and that's that's you know jack cardiff at his best in a film like this where he's using his tools to create these um 
elements and allowing it to actually uh, become a part of the film where where the story uh, you got these hands reaching through the light controlling her i mean that to me is just it's it's just a beautiful way to take the light and and use it as a tool as a part of the story i mean it's 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 beautifully done his uh, i i have not seen um all of the documentary uh, film. There was a documentary on on uh, Jack Cameraman, the life and work of Jack Cardiff. Have you seen this one? You know, I haven't. That's something I, I want to seek, but I haven't. I gotten around to it yet. There are there are clips of it out there, and and you know you can see little terribly rendered kind of pieces of it. But it, it's one of those that I think is worth picking up. We'll put a link to it in the notes. Um, if you're if you are into the cinema, the other the other uh, there's a book out there that's not available on ebook that makes me very sad. It's the Michael Powell autobiography, and word has it that this is the the best on filmmaking that there has been written. Uh, is is Michael Powell's book on on uh, you know on making movies? Right. Have you read that one either? That's um, it's what I haven't read, but uh, yeah, it's been on my list of books to read for quite a while. So it's yeah. I'm gonna have to pick it up one of these days. Yeah, uh, we'll put a link to that one in there too. Um, this uh, so this movie. Um, let's uh, can you talk a little bit about what you learned about the restoration? Because this movie was was it was is one of those that was handled with great care. It, it, well, yeah, and, and like you had mentioned, I mean, Martin Scorsese really, really was behind this in a, in a large way. He um, was very much influenced by this film as a as a child when he saw it, and just the stunning use of color, the story, the way it was told, everything about it really drew him in. And so, it's always had a place um, in his heart. And in fact, to the point where you know, when he as he grew. As a filmmaker, he started using Thelma Schoonmacher as his editor, who is the widow of Michael Powell. And she had, uh, you know, between the two of them, um, Thelma and Martin Scorsese, they, they both really championed this as a film that needed to get um, funding to, to get restored. Because like I had, had said, there had been, been so many problems with the um, with the way that all of these prints were looking, and with this three strip Technicolor process, it really just was falling into ruin. And so um, Scorsese has his little um, um, film restoration uh, company, and I can't remember what it's called right now, but they uh, they took it on, and uh, between them and uh, Warner Brothers, they really just spent, you know, a very, very long time working on this film, trying to get it to um, to look as magnificent as it does. And it took a long time. And even if you look at an older version, because I believe they actually struck a fresh print of it in the late 80s, and they that at the time had been the best looking that this film had ever been. And... Um, even then, if you look at the the shots of the film then to how it looks now, I mean, it's mind boggling. I mean, it looks like they just could have shot this yesterday. It really does. It's a, it's a stunning, stunning look. And they did have to because of the nature of the the moving the the way that the colors were um, had become modeled and all of that. They did have to use a, a lot of digital restoration on the film. Um, but really, I mean, using the best digital tools to still make it look like a film from the forties, not trying to, you know, fix it and make it look like it, you know, it's, uh, you know, shot on all modern technology. And I mean, it's, it really is a, a masterpiece. I, um, it, it's, I've got it running here and it's just, it, it's mesmerizing. I, I cannot get over just how crisp and clean it is. I mean, there's, there is there's no jitter in the color elements. There's no fringing. I mean, it's just perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a stunning piece. And, you know, I think what they really were able to bring out uh, in this movie are the amazingly fancy dresses that Lermontov wears when he's alone. <laughs> yeah, they're very much like uh, Russian, uh, like things you'd see a Russian czar wearing it, it, or something. It is. I... You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> I absolutely love that. That he wears <laughs> these robes that are so elegant. <laughs> oh, I know. And you notice every it's time so this is this is one of those boy, uh, you know, Anton uh, Wahlberg's his his I you know who knows how these little character elements come together, but but the uh, there are a number of points throughout the film where he is alone in his chambers and there is a knock on the door, whether it's in his office or in his, in his, you know, his suite. And there's a knock on the door. And there is always that like five seconds of preparation that he goes through where <laughs> I don't think we're used to seeing where either he goes around and turns on all the lights and gets in position to say, enter. Right. right. And, and that I think is it, it, that plus the fancy robes, uh, I, I think is something that I really would, am, am going to be taking on in my own personality <laughs> uh it's one of the things i've learned from this movie that i'm going to take on i need to do more preparation before i say come in <laughs> it's important to set the scene you know take the five seconds to prepare that's, for the that's right, right you're gonna to have to get a nice fancy smoking jacket <laughs> i absolutely need a smoking jacket can do you uh so, so uh we've talked about scorsese uh scorsese's um you know influence on this film uh, what are your thoughts on how this film has has influenced cinema beyond Scorsese? Uh, do you you know how do you can you trace the the sort of lineage of of other movies and elements that they have um, they have built upon the from the Red Shoes? Uh, notable uh, examples in well, cinema? yeah, I think I think a, a big one is an American in Paris. Um, I don't think the big dance the the big dance number in that one i don't think would have happened um without this having happened the fact that they were able to stop the movie and have a 15 minute ballet yeah. i think very much allowed the filmmakers of that um to say look look what they did we can do it too let's let's have a big dance number and you know i think it was very much a success in that film um it's and then from then on, I think it really became clear that people could kind of do that and allow for those sorts of things to happen and allow that kind of you know uh, pause while something happened. I mean, that it, obviously it's something that still relates to your story, though. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to just the the uh, fabulous use of of color and the way that they subjectively went into the dance and it wasn't just objectively looking from the audience i think that was another element uh, that they did use in an american in paris and a lot of other musicals after that point i mean i think this film really did end up influencing um, musicals more than anything else after it came out in 48 and uh, what filmmakers felt that they could do and how they could use the music and the the uh, the numbers in a film to um, create this magic almost it, it, you know when you talk about an American Paris and the the sort of lineage of musical movies it's almost less uh, influence than it is permission that this yeah. movie gave them permission to do things differently and American in Paris is you know came shortly after and it was the film that that you know it's 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 almost the happy. Uh, you know, it's like, gosh, I really love the red shoes. I wonder what it would be like if everybody was in a good mood. <laughs> no one. Let's let's dying. make the American American in Paris. <laughs> let's do let's do the red shoes with no bridge thing at the end. Let's see how that works. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> uh, this is a it, it's a it's a powerful film, and I'm I'm you know now that we've we've talked about it for an hour, I'm embarrassed that I hadn't seen it before. Uh, it's it's one that I'm I'm. I really, um, you know, it, it's funny if you haven't seen it, uh, go get the criterion collection of this film and watch it and see if it doesn't put pieces together for you. If you, if you love movies, you see this movie and all of a sudden everything, you, you know, you see a line, a line of, of production and style and tone and storytelling that comes together I think in a, in a new way, when you see this film, you see, you know, sort of how it's constructed and you see, it, it makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. You know, movies that come after it uh, begin to make more sense as a result. Yeah. And it, I mean, it came out right after the war and there was, um, it was a time when, 
when people I think were looking for a little more brightness and color and magic in their films. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it really did kind of help allow for that to happen more in, uh, in, in film afterward. So speaking of uh, more awesome movies, where, where are we going from here? Did we, did we nail that down next week? Uh, yeah, next week um, for the next in our in our two part Jack Cardiff series, we're going to talk about the African Queen. Oh, I love this movie. So yeah, it'll be a fun one to fun one to chat about. Very good. Um, but anything uh, we you know we haven't talked about we haven't talked about specifically the the um, the, the notes on production. Do you we usually we you know when we talk about budget and such? Do you? Uh, uh, do we have any any good notes on that? Or you know, we... I didn't find a lot. Um, what I did find was that um, it went over budget. <laughs> they, uh, I mean, you know, they were filming this. Obviously, they filmed it in London. They did go down and film some in Monte Carlo, and it was a uh, an expensive production. Um, it was in the line of uh, Arthur Rank's films, Arthur Rank Productions. Um, who um well i the the financiers behind the film when they f saw the first cut were very worried <laughs> they thought that they had just spent a lot of money on something that was just going to be a complete bomb and weren't very happy particularly because it had gone over budget and you know this was after powell and pressburger had had released a number of their their big films the life and death of colonel blimp um, I know where I'm going. A matter of life and death. Black Narcissus um, had all come out before this, and so they they were names in kind of the 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 film world. Um, collectively, the two of them were known as the Archers. And um, but still, the financiers were very worried. So much so that they didn't even give the film a big release when it came out in 1948 in England. There was no red carpet. There was nothing like that. There wasn't, they didn't even have a movie poster designed for the film when it came out. Um, they were almost more embarrassed by it. And it wasn't until this situation in New York when it played for so long, um, that, um, they actually started feeling like, Oh, maybe it, is something that people will like and it ended up going on to to be very successful it did win an oscar for um the best best original score and i believe it was also nominated for um best director for uh, michael powell and emmerich pressburger and um I, i'm not can't remember if there were other uh oscars that it won for it won for two i think the other one was um was the art direction. Yeah, one for best art direction. Hein Heckroth, um, an amazing painter. He did all the, the um, well, he was the, he was the production designer, art director for this film. Up until this point, he'd only been a, a, a painter. And so that's why so many of the sets feel so painterly. Um, so the two, so Hein Heckroth and Arthur Lawson, art direction, set decoration, won an Oscar. Brian Easdale won an Oscar for best music it was also nominated for best editing reginald mills best picture and best writing um i guess it wasn't best director but emmerich pressburger wrote it and and um and uh was nominated for an oscar for it it's now considered like on on uh the uh top 10 of british films it's you know numerous people have given it a lot of accolades um but it took a while. It did take a little while for it to uh, to be realized to its uh, full potential. Um, so, um, and I, you know, I guess we should also mention some of the other amazing performers in the film. Marius Goring. Yes, yeah. You know, I was I was about to say Maura Shearer is is one that that I think is worth note as mm -hmm. we kind of wrap up because you know she was she was a. It, this her real life story sort of mimics the the her discovery story the red shoes as a you, you know she was dancing in a ballet company and she was discovered and uh, you know didn't agree to do the film right away i think she was you know and she was 22 when she finally agreed uh, to take on the film and um uh, you know what one of the things we we discussed in in the commentary you know when we talked about the film with David Zinman was 
um, you know, that she uh, really ended up sort of resenting uh, the film, no matter in in spite of her terrific performance. You know, her career after was was really marked by the red shoes and not by, you know, another forty or fifty years of of work that she had done elsewhere mm-hmm. uh, in ballet. Uh, and and uh, you know, I found that interesting, you know, how a, how a real a sort of visionary performance, and I, I think it was Michael Powell who said, you know, I, I don't think I ever knew what a natural was. Uh, in Moira Shearer, Moira, Moira Shearer, I have seen it. She, you know, the way she um, relates to the camera, the way she relates to the other actors, the way she, you know, her, her performance on screen was was that only described as somebody who has a, a real natural talent. Which is really interesting because she, yeah, like you said, she had no intention of ever going into film. She only wanted to be a dancer. And uh, she was dancing and they asked her to be in the film and she's like, no, 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 I'm not interested. Yeah. And they, and, and, and uh, Michael Powell kept pushing her and pushing her and she was like, you know, it sounds great, but I just, I don't want to do it and best of luck to you. And so he went off trying to find someone else a year later, long after she had forgotten about it, he came back and was just like, I still haven't found anybody and I still want you. And she's just like, I don't want to do this. And and he actually went and talked to her, um, the head of her ballet troupe, who's just like, look, you have to do this thing. And we're sick of being pestered by this guy. Just go do it and just get get it done and don't worry about it. And she's like, oh, all right, I'll just do it and that'll be that. And I won't have to think about it ever again. <laughs> it, yeah. was just, it was the funniest mentality to be going into a film. And then she did an amazing performance. She she was amazing, and and you know she ended up doing more movies after that. She's you know I think she did you know six six seven other films. After this, she did retire from ballet uh, eventually, and uh, you know I don't know half a decade after after the Red Shoes, she finally gave it up and and uh, you know pursued acting, which I you know I think it's a fantastic sort of story of transformation. But uh, but this movie marked a. a to, to go into it with such sort of resignation. Yeah. You know, yeah. To, to go into such a performance on a sigh. Is, uh, <laughs> right. Very telling. Uh, it is, is very funny. So, um, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, what sorry, are we, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. So am I, right. I, 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 it's a, it's a beautiful film. It's definitely one well worth watching and worth seeking out and uh, and enjoying. It's um, a lot of a lot of dancers say that they saw this film at a young age and it's what's what inspired them to to start dancing. And um, you know, while I never have had any interest in being a dancer myself, it's definitely a film I can appreciate and enjoy and and uh, look at the nature of art and and what art means to people and how it drives people. And it's it's definitely a film that uh, I think everybody should see at least once in their life. It for me the most sort of uh you know there are those there are those little scenes that that you know, I think I, I that stick with me as sort of the most personally inspirational uh, on and when you talk about the nature of art and and creation. And mm-hmm. I think this movie is for me. There is the beautiful sequence where she is. You know, she's picked up at her hotel in that fantastic gown, and mm. she's driven up the the sort of coastal highway uh, and into that old. Um, you know, broken down chateau, and she walks up the you know the seemingly endless flight of stairs, weeds overgrown these flights of stairs, and she's up. At, she gets up at the top of the stairs, and they're they're in, you know, the whole sort of artistic um, team is mm-hmm. is inside in the room, and they offer her the position, and they send her on her way. They offer her the position of of prima ballerina in in the red shoes. And they send her on her way. And they, the way this shot is framed, it's sort of in this, this big master shot. And you see all of the creators around the room. And she's standing in the middle of them. And then she leaves. And they all come together at the piano. And, mm-hmm. and then she's done. And it does, but that, it's that sweeping motion where they all come together at the piano. And, and the, the energy on film is, you know, you can feel that 
magic is about to happen. Yeah. And that's a feeling that I I want in when I create, you know, that that's what I'm what he captured on on film is exactly the emotional connection that I'm constantly looking for in every sort of creative project that I take on. I think it is that to me is is personally the real highlight of the movie. That's that's where it that's where it yeah. all comes together. It definitely it not not just in dance, but in film and every other art form. Yeah. That's that energy, that excitement, that drive. And I think you're right. I think it's it's captured so perfectly at that moment and uh and really highlights the the uh the direction the film is taking. Mm-hmm. So good film. Yeah. 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 Fantastic yeah. one to talk about. All right. African Queen next week. Yes, indeed. So we'll uh pick up on Jack Cardiff and uh and uh talk about the Nazis and uh and the jungle and the African queen mm, herself. Nazis in the jungle. Mm. <laughs> what more do you need? I can't wait. <laughs> We wanted to take a moment to thank you for your continued support over the years. It's hard to believe that we've been having weekly in-depth discussions about movies since 2011. That's right, 12 years and counting. Producing this show is a labor of love for us, but it does require a lot of time and effort each week. If you enjoy our podcast and would love to help keep it going, there are some easy ways you can show your support. One is by using our Originals page to shop for the original source material that movies we've discussed were based on. That's right. In season one alone, we covered 13 films adapted from books or plays, from Charlie Kaufman's adaptation to David Fincher adaptations like Fight Club. In season two, we covered even more, like Powell and Pressburger's The Red Shoes and The African Queen from our series about legendary cinematographer Jack Cardiff. We can't forget about the four Jason Bourne movies we talked about. Love those movies. Well... The original trilogy, at least. <laughs> for our Richard D. Zanuck series, we did Jaws, Rush, Big Fish, and more. And for our horror series, we talked about John Carpenter's The Thing, which was adapted from Who Goes There? We did our first great car chase series with movies like Bullet, The French Connection, and Drive. And for the holidays, we did Preston Sturgis's Christmas in July. We had a great John Huston series with adaptations like The Maltese Falcon and The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And for our baseball series, Moneyball with Brad Pitt. Have I told you lately how much I love that movie? Uh, yeah, I think you have. Plus, our Magician series and Heist film series had adaptations as well. Tons of page-to-screen gems. Listeners can find the details and links to the original material at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book, play, or movie you buy through our links helps support the show, and it's no extra cost to you. So dive in and get your next read today. Thenextreel.com slash originals has all the films adapted from other sources that not only we have covered, but all of the shows on the Next Real family of podcasts. Check it out and get reading. Support the show and build your reading list. It's a win-win. Head to thenextreel.com slash originals. Hold up. 